Hello, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to our webinar today, Kiri Travel Presents Exploration Indonesia. We're broadcasting from the United States and also today from Indonesia, and we will learn more about our guest speaker in just a moment. But right now, I would like to turn it over to the General Manager at Kiri USA, Michael Healy. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much, Lee. It's a very kind introduction of you. And most importantly, thank you so much to everyone who's taken time out of their day to join us today for our webinar about Kiri Travel and Indonesia. So today we'll be taking an in-depth look at Indonesia, what makes it so special, and most importantly, how we can help create your clients' uh, dream experiences. As you probably know, Indonesia is an absolutely massive country. There's thousands and thousands of islands. So there's absolutely no shortage of things for your clients to experience. Today, we're actually going to only be able to go on or learn about a select few destinations. So we're going to focus on Bali, Java, Lombok, and Flores, all places in which we actually have offices on the ground. So a bit of background about Kiri Travel. We're a highly customized business-to-business -business destination management company. We have offices in Sri Lanka, the Maldives, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Indonesia, and I'm actually based here in Denver, Colorado. We opened up the Kiri USA offices about three and a half years ago, and that was basically to help provide our US-based agents with the best service from both sides of the globe. As a company, we really pride ourselves on highly customized experiences to meet each and every one of your clients' needs in terms of interest, budget, travel style, basically whatever it is they need, we're happy to help out with. Our business strategy is to focus on the triple bottom line, which is people, planet, profit. People is, of course, vital to our business. Our staff, our agents, your clients, and the locals of each of our destinations is of the utmost importance. Our goal is to use travel as a tool to connect people from all sides of the globe. We believe in making genuine connections between traveler and local, and most importantly, that this is going to be beneficial for everyone involved. Which brings us to the importance of sustainability. We absolutely love each and every one of the destinations we work, and so we know it's our responsibility to not only preserve them for future generations, but to lead the charge on responsible tourism in Asia. We're, and as profit goes, we rely simply on the agents. So when you're successful, we're successful. So via webinars such as this and daily communications, what we want to do is train you about Asia, our products, and get you really passionate and excited about the destination the way we are. The more you're able to talk about it knowledgeably and passionately, the more sales you're going to get. Again, your success is basically our success. And in Indonesia, just like every single one of our countries, our common theme is sharing our passion for discovery. Every single one of us is programmed to travel. It's absolutely in our DNA. At our company meetings, we all talk about our favorite places, places we want to go to next, and that's really at the basis of what we do. All we want to do is share that passion with your clients. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is introduce you to one of our most passionate colleagues, who is Gonzalo, who's based out of Bali and woke up with the roosters today to be with us. So Gonzalo, I hope you've had your coffee, and we're all excited to hear about Indonesia, more in depth from you, and have at it. Okay, thank you, Mike, for the introduction, and hello, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us on this webinar. I'm, well, my name is Gonzalo, I'm branch manager for Bali, and I will get right started. Let's start talking about at Bali. When, when you hear the name Bali, the, the name alone suggests images of villages, temples with long ceremonial processions, beaches with uh, palm trees, fiery fruit, and, you know, the cool breeze of the ocean. That is all good, but there is also a talk of Bali becoming, uh, there is a little bit of an uglier side of Bali. And what I mean by that is that uh, you might hear people saying, oh, Bali has become too developed, 
there is uh, traffic nowadays, there is crowded beaches, and some of the sites have become tourist traps. And I'm going to tell you something, is there is no denying that. But what I'm going to say is that since the opening of the Bali office, we set up one goal. And this goal is to bring Bali back to travelers. Uh, our inspiration came by the works of uh, some great artists who live on the island in the 1930s. For example, the German painter Walter Spies or the Mexican caricaturist Miguel Covarrubias. These early visitors to Bali have such an amazing experience on the island that we try to recreate uh, to travelers those early Balinese experiences. At first, of course, uh, this looked like a monumental task, how you do it, but then it became very clear. The magic of, of Bali lives on its people. So our work was to concentrate on developing the right activities that would reach travelers to the heart of, to the, heart of the island. And the heart of the island is its people. So as I just said, the essence of Bali is its people. So let me explain a, a little bit of our programs and how they connect travelers to, to people. But before I do that, I will give you some general facts uh, about Bali that are always good to, to remember. Bali is a destination in itself. Um, there are not many places in the world where you can find nature and volcanoes as it is the case of Gunung Agum or West Bali National Park. Beaches like you have in Sanur, Changu or Pemuteran. An ancient living culture, uh, that's quite unique. You know, you have places where you have a culture, but a, a living culture uh, that still carries on today, as you will find in, say, for example, Ubud. Uh, also, I find that uh, the Balinese people are some of the most genuine and friendly not just in Asia, but I think in the world. And, of course, you have some great uh, accommodations, service that will impress anybody from a luxury to a budget traveler. The trick to Bali is to bring people to the places where they will feel they are in Bali. And let, let me make this clear. Let's say your clients go to Nusa Dua or to Seminyak they will have a good time, but they will get a generic, a generic experience. Uh, no difference that you will go to, let's say, Positano in Italy or Puerto Vallarta. I mean, Nusa is a great place, but it doesn't reflect upon Bali. So what we're trying to do is to bring people to the places where they will really find uh, the, 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 the true essence of the island. So if I mention places like, let's say, Munduk, Sidemen, West Bali National Park, or Changu, these are relatively new destinations, and in, it is in these new destinations that we can, you can really connect uh, with, the, with the island. Uh, just before I go into the signature experiences, one more thing I want to say about uh, Bali is that it also works perfectly as a hub. You know, you have international connections to every, practically every, every city in Asia. And of course, Bali is the great hub to travel within Indonesia. So whether you're going to Lombok, Java, Flores, Sumba, Sumbawa, Sulawesi, I mean, I can go on and on. Uh, you must, uh, any, every traveler that wishes to, to travel around Indonesia, at some point you have to touch upon, upon Bali. Um, let me begin with the, talking about our programs. And as, as I said earlier, uh, what, it, what it means to, why it's so important to have programs that connect people with people, especially in a place like Bali. Let's start with one of, of my favorites. It's called Dinner with a Royal. You know, uh, Bali has had kings for, for, for uh, eons, and the kings have survived the test of time. You know, despite colonization by the Dutch, who took over over Indonesia for over 300 years, and most recently in World War II, the Japanese uh, occupation, the, the kings of Bali have, have endured and they have remained. Uh, nowadays, with a new uh, political map in Indonesia, the kings and the royal families of Bali have reinvented themselves as repositories of culture and tradition. So whenever you have a, a village uh, cremation or ceremony, these royal figures are always called 
upon to proceed over certain points. So they're very important uh, to this day. So what about giving your clients a chance to meet a Balinese princess in her own home and having the opportunity to learn firsthand the past and present of Bali from someone who really has seen it all? If it already sounds amazing, I think of, of indulging in an extraordinary dinner with locally farmed products and both traditional and modern cooking techniques. I believe that sharing a, a table over delicious food is the best way to connect with people and to learn about yourself and also about others. And having the chance to sit with a member of a Balinese royalty, I think it puts uh, the experience into, into another level. I have done this experience several times. We, we developed it from, from this office. And every time is different, and the reason that it's different is because the conversation is always different. And for anybody who enjoys people, culture, and of course food, this is a must. Let me go into the next uh, experience. This is called A Day in the Life of a Balinese Artist. Uh, Bali and art are one uh, indivisible entity. For the days of the likes of uh, Rudolf Barnett, uh, a Dutch artist who worked together with the King of Ubud and founded the Pitamaha Museum, or the great works of the Kamasan painters in Klumkum, or even going further back in time, the theatrical drama of the Baron and Legon dances, Bali is art. Uh, as a traveler, it will be hard to get to know artists themselves. I mean, unless you're spending months in Bali, the chances that you will meet a, a, an artist are very slim. So we want to connect people to real artists, because we believe that art embodies uh, Bali so well. Rather than going to an art gallery, or worse still, I mean, going to a shop that's terrible, who likes that, we want you to meet a real artist in their home. And not just learn about their work, whether it's a painter, a, a sculpture, or a mass maker, but also learn about their life journey and what uh, brought them to become an artist. We uh, top up this experience with a lunch in a Balinese compound, giving travelers the, the chance to sample some terrific local food, but also to see a, a local compound. Balinese live in, in this um, family arranged compounds in which several families will live in one place. And again, no, you, unless uh, it, it will be really hard to get invited to a Balinese compound. So by, by doing this program, you get a chance to meet an artist, to learn about uh, the culture of Bali, but also to, to see a Balinese compound from the inside. It's a, it's a great experience. Let me go into the last uh, program that I will be talking about in Bali. It's called the Munti Gunung Hike. And after that, I will go into Java. But let's talk first about Muntiguno. Um, the first two programs that I talk about are more connected to people and art and food. This is a more active program. Who does not like to go hiking in a remote area and don't see anybody there? I mean, if I will tell you that you can do that in Bali between two of the great volcanoes, Gunung Agung and Gunung Batur, you will think that I'm, I'm kidding you. But no, it's, it's true. Uh, you can do it. And you can do it and be the only one on the mountain. How, how amazing is that? We have partnered uh, with a philanthropist. I can tell you his name. His name is Daniel Elber. And Daniel Elber, uh, is, he was a Swiss banker, rich guy. He had a villa in Bali, and so he was coming here quite often. And he realized that a lot of the people who were begging on the street came from an area known as Munti. So he, he asked himself, OK, why, why most of the beggars come, come from there? And the answer is very simple. It's a very dry area. So as opposed to the rest of Bali where cultivation is possible because of irrigation and, and rain, in the Munti area it's very dry. There is no, no rivers and it gets very little rain. So he set up a project to build these homes that collect rainwater uh, during the, the short rainy season and then use this water for irrigation during the rest of the year. So now these people who before were kind of forced to, to beg in different parts of the island, have a meaningful uh, jobs. Uh, they can uh, cultivate uh, cashew nuts, 
they also doing weaving, they are doing, they are uh, making hammocks, and all of these uh, villages and small uh, enterprises, you see them as you hike in between these two amazing mountains. Um, an amazing program is not is not a very difficult hike. It's a it's a medium medium rate hike. What I also love about it is that when you do it, you are basically the, the only one on the mountain. The, the idea of the project is not to flood this area with people, but we only have, we only run it one time a day. So whether you have a couple or you have a group, it's only done for, for that group, and there will be no other visitors on that day, which makes it unique. And, and the best part is that the, the money that is collected by this, a portion of it goes to fund this, this project that I was telling you about. Great, great hike. Okay, let's, uh, I can go on and on about Bali. Let's uh, continue with Java. And Java, it's an island that perhaps it's one of the most remarkable uh, tropical islands in the world. Why? It is located on the Indonesian Ring of Fire and is home to some of the most beautiful uh, yet uh, devastating volcanoes in the world. Let's do a little brush up on the high school geography lesson. Maybe you heard the names of Bromo and Ichen. These two volcanoes are some of the most active and imposing in the world. You know, it's huge, two, three thousand meters steaming calderas. And both of these amazing volcanoes are located in Java. Volcanoes are one thing. Uh, Pair that with an ancient culture, and you begin to see why Java is a world travel destination. Um, during the 19th century, uh, you might have heard of uh, Sir Stamford Raffles. He came, became later the original settler of Singapore. He did a lot of research on the, the archaeological sites, uh, and of course, you're probably familiar with the name of Borobudur, which is now a World Heritage Site that predates Angkor Wat by 300 years. And so in Java you have these uh, two amazing things. You have uh, nature, but you also have an ancient, uh, an ancient culture uh, and, and incredible archaeological sites. I will say that, uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Peru, but going to Peru and not visiting Machu Picchu will be a shame. The same is for Java. Now, if you go to Java and you don't visit Borobudur, you are missing out big time. Um, let me talk very briefly about uh, Borobudur and Prambanan. Uh, Borobudur, it doesn't need much explanation. It's, uh, it's the largest uh, Buddhist, or one of the largest Buddhist structures in the world. It is, uh, it is quite, a, quite a sight to, to behold. And as I just made the example with Machu Picchu, it's, it's kind of a must-see. But as, as Willem, the founder of, of Kiri, would say, you can visit these great uh, places, but you need to make it more interesting. No? So what we do is we go there in the morning, uh, we call it, you know, highlights done right. Uh, you visit it at sunrise when it's not very busy. You see the, uh, the sun rising with the volcanoes at the back. It's just an enchanting experience. But that's not all. We combine it with a bicycle trip on Chandirejo, which is a small village. Uh, very close, it's just about 10-15 minutes from, uh, from Borobudur. So you don't only get to see the archaeological site, which is, which is incredible, but you also get to see the uh, everyday local life when you go biking on this village. The same goes to Prambanan. You know, Prambanan, it's in Chokchakarta. It's, uh, it's a great site, not just because it's beautiful, you can see the, the photo uh, below Borobudur, but because a lot of Indonesian families go there. And, you know, you uh, you, you walk in Prambanan and you see these families picnicking and it's a great introduction to, to, to Borobudur. So normally if we have clients going to Chokchakarta, we suggest, you know, go to Prambanan, see it because it's beautiful, but also because you get to, to see a lot of local families and it's a, it, it, it feels much more alive than, than Borobudur. And then of course for the, for the grand final, you, you travel to Magellan and go to Borobudur. Okay, let's... Uh, talk now about uh, Batik. I think Batik is one of the main uh, cultural expressions uh, in, in Java 
and I will describe two programs now. Uh, I will start with the uh, foodie program that we have in Chocacarta and uh, afterwards I will talk about a little bit uh, about something that we're doing in solo with Batik. But the reason that I brought the, the subject of Batik is because we have an office in Chocacarta. Uh, Mike uh, mentions, of course, we have an office in Indonesia, but we have three offices. And one of the offices is in Bali, where I'm, I'm talking uh, to you right now, but we also have an office in, in Chocacarta, in Java, and one in Lombok that I will talk later. But let's, uh, let's start with uh, Chocacarta. Uh, Chocacarta is the gate to Borobudur. It is also a, a beautiful city. That's where Pramanan is located, the Kraton. But we believe it's also a great city for food. So we developed a program called the Chok Jakarta Foodie. And the Chok Jakarta Foodie is a chance for people to uh, experience local food and see how these uh, influences have uh, translated into the food. Java was conquered by the Portuguese and later by the Dutch and the gastronomy reflects upon these uh, influences. So put together a walk in the evening in Chok Jakarta, uh, experiencing local food as you go along, and you will get an idea of what this program is about. Um, I'll give you a short personal note. I did this a while ago, and we were brought into this place, you know, a, a wooden bench, a plastic tabletops. They bring you this cup of coffee called Kopi Yos, the coffee is already super hot, and then they throw in a coal in it, and it, it's kind of like a volcano. It's, um, it's a little bit strange. The taste of the coffee is also a little bit strange. Uh, it tastes kind of minerally. That's the best word I can come up with. But these kind of experiences are what you remember when you, you go back home. And yeah, we have a great team of guides that bring this, uh, these local food stalls to life. You know, because you might be walking there on, on your own, but if somebody doesn't explain it, then you don't know what, you, what you're looking at. So going to Chok Jakarta and not doing the Chok Jakarta foodie will be missing out. Now let's talk about the, the next experiences uh, in Java. I'm going to talk about the Salatiga horses. Um, Salatiga is a place in central Java. And the reason we go there is we found this, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, we found this Dutch uh, Indonesian family who are uh, training horses uh, in the mountains, in a small state, and the way they train their horses is by uh, not breaking them. Uh, I'm from Argentina, so in, in Argentina, horses are, are broken before you can ride them. I think it's the same in the US. But it's more, you remember that movie, The, the Horse Whisperer? They do it in a, in a very gentle kind of way. It's a unique experience for families because you get to interact with the horses in a whole different way. Children uh, love it. But it's also a great experience for anybody who loves animals. <coughs> Excuse me. And for anybody who uh, wants to see a part of Java that is usually not visited, because Salatiga is not on the main, on the main routes. Having said that, Salatiga is uh, between Semarang and Chocacarta. So it's easy to combine with, uh, with some other places. And yes, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful different way to, uh, to experience uh, horse riding in Java. No? It's in a, in a place you would not, not think of it. Let's move on to the next experience uh, I'm going to talk about for uh, Java. Remember, I was uh, talking about uh, Batik before. I think Batik is one of the no, it, I don't think it is the largest uh, cultural manifestation in Java, and you cannot, uh, when, when, when you look at a culture and, and Java, you, you must have batik. But of course, you know, you can say, uh, again, as with the day with the Balinese artists, you know, going to a shop, who, who wants to do that? Nobody. Uh, I think it's better to experience batik in a, in a different way, so we take you to a small city called Solo, Solo is also known as Surakarta, and in Surakarta you have a small neighborhood called Kampung Laweyan, where you can uh, go around, they have small streets called gangs, uh, it's kind of like alleyways, and we take you on a bechak, a bechak is a, it's kind of like a, like a bicycle ride, but you, 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 you can sit on it and, 
a guy at the back, like a, you call it a try show in English. And it's just great experience. You know, you're in this little bed shack, you go into some workshops, you see how batik is made. Uh, for families, we can do it, the children can actually make batik. And Solo is a small city, so it's a, the, the, the city in itself is it's, it's worth visiting. And yeah, it's another great experience, uh, good guides, and seeing a cultural part of Java that is uh, not overlooked, but it's done in a different way. You know, we, we take you to the place where, where Batik was born. You know, it's funny, today is, is Friday, and it's Friday in, in Indonesia. And the president says every Friday people have to, have to wear Batik. So uh, it's something that's still pretty much alive. You know, on, on Friday, everybody wears, uh, wears Batik shirts in, in Indonesia, which are quite comfortable, actually. All right, let's talk to about Lombok. Uh, Lombok is a place maybe people are not uh, as familiar with as Bali and Java. Uh, for many, Lombok is Bali's little cousin. In fact, uh, Lombok is much more than that. It has a unique, different culture represented by the fierce uh, Sasak people uh, who pride themselves in their culture and their way of life. Uh, nature is also present in Lombok with the dramatic uh, uh, Rinjani volcano which dominates much of the island scenery. Lo Lombok has also escaped the rapid development seen in other parts of Indonesia, especially in parts of Java and, and Bali. So a lot of its beaches are less crowded and the general uh, pace of the island is slower. Finally, Lombok uh, has that kind of frontier feel that you get in places where there are not so many travelers. So you might find yourself snorkeling alone in South Lombok, or you might find gazing yourself on top of uh, Gunung Rinjani, which is a small group of people. You can safely say that Lombok will be Indonesia's uh, next big thing. Lombok is also very dear to us, uh, as uh, we have a large operation in the island. B uh, Kiri Travel actually bought a company in Lombok, and this company had been there for nine years. So not only do we have an office in Lombok, something that other uh, DMCs can only dream of, we have a group of passionate and knowledgeable staff on the island that, that they know it like no other. We have a great, uh, we have a, a, a massive comparative advantage in Lombok, and that is having, a, having a, an office that's been there for nine years. And in Lombok, I will just talk about two signature programs. Uh, the first one that I will talk about it's called the Senaru Panorama Walk, and this is an active uh, activity. Uh, okay, let me just talk about this uh, slide about uh, go back this mic about the what people are, are missing in, in Lombok. You know, uh, as opposed to and this is really what I talked before. No, it's a, it's an island where you get the uh, the the local feel much more than you. Would get in other places and the reason that, that you get that is because it's less less developed no so you have you know you have the Gili Islands with great diving and snorkeling you have the Rinjani volcano uh, with amazing hikes and I'm going to talk about that uh, later you have a different culture the Sasak and yes it's, it's an island that's still uh, developing and it's a it's it's a it's a new place but it's a place that is worth worth visiting let, and, and of course you have good connections with, with Bali and, and Java and you can even fly to Lombok from Singapore so you can even start your trip in Lombok. Let me talk about the Senaru Panorama Walk. I was just saying about uh, Rinjani. Rinjani is a massive mountain, about 3,000 meters. It's the tutelar guardian of, of the island. On the slopes, uh, climbing uh, Rinjani, we can do that but it, that, that means you have to be very fit. But for people that want to do a great hike and don't want to, uh, uh, they're not, not serious, serious hikers, you can do the Senaru Panorama Walk. On the slopes of the volcano, you have villages of Sasak people. And here we partner with the, the women of Senaru. And in Senaru, uh, the government of New Zealand uh, a couple of years ago did a, a training program for women. So what we're doing is we're working together with women who live in these villages and in their spare time they make an extra living by uh, taking clients onto, onto a hike. The hike uh, goes from uh, rice fields to a waterfall and 
I was fortunate enough to do this hike uh, a couple of months ago with my son. He's an avid uh, hiker. He's only five, but he's, he's quite a good hiker. And I can tell you the images of the sun rising over the rice fields, you know, crossing a small stream with the guide. Her name was Resi, uh, holding my son. And, you know, sharing a conversation about village life. Uh, I mean, these memories have really etched themselves uh, in our memory. It was a beautiful, beautiful experience. And, of course, you get to see these villages where people have been living from farming, uh, agriculture, and Yes, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful part of Lombok. Let me talk about uh, one more experience and then we'll talk about Flores. Uh, the next experience is called cooking in the rice fields. And cooking in the rice fields is in the south of Lombok. Uh, it is also uh, in an area which is not far from the Rinjani volcano, but the first one that I talk about, Senaru, is in the north. This is in the south part. And the south part uh, gets much more water, so you get uh, agriculture, beautiful rice fields. And the idea is to take you walking through the farmland, through the rice fields, build up an appetite, and then go to a small wooden, wooden shack where together with your guide you will learn the tricks to cook a real Sasak meal. And of course, cooking classes, everybody does cooking classes. But I can tell you nobody does a cooking class in this part of Lombok, in that setting, I'm cooking a traditional Sasak meal. So again, we're going back to experiences. There are things that you will not find anywhere else, experiences that will connect you with the destination, with people, with the traditional way of life, and as in this case, with amazing spicy food. All right, let's talk about Flores. Flores is the last island I will talk about. Uh, Flores, uh, it's a place that by the name itself, I think it triggers a will to travel. Not many people have been fortunate enough to visit this island. Um, the island, Flores means flowers in Portuguese. And I don't know if you know this, but the island was uh, conquered in 1511 by uh, Alfonso de Alburquerque. This is a, a, a legendary Portuguese uh, naval commander. And yes, uh, these Portuguese uh, explorers were in search of the Spice Islands and they stumbled upon Flores. And the difference that you will get culturally in Flores with the, the rest of the Indonesian islands, and this comes obviously from the Portuguese influence, is that it's Catholic. It's a complete uh, Catholic island. Uh, Bali, as you know, is Hindu. Uh, Java, Java and Lombok are Muslim. And uh, yeah, Flores is Catholic. I was there a while ago and I remember we arrived on a Sunday and Mass was going on. It was before Christmas. You know, there were Christmas tree the decoration. So the island has its own, its own character, very different from the rest. Uh, Flores is also the jumping point to visit the Komodo Archipelago. The Komodo Archipelago, it's an authentic evolution laboratory. Uh, you might have heard, I'm, I'm sure you know about the Komodo dragons. Uh, but it's not just the Komodo dragons, it, there is so much biodiversity both underwater and, and on the islands that uh, as, as a nature destination, Flores is amazing. It is also a great place for beaches, uh, usually a trip to Flores. I'm not going to talk about any, any specific, pro we have a small operational office in Flores, so we, we know the island really well. And I can, we have many experiences, but I will tell you a little bit in, in big lines, otherwise I'm going to be talking for too long. But Flores, if you go to Flores, you go to La Juan Bacho, that is the entry point. You take a boat, a wooden boat. We always recommend taking a, a Pinisi, that's, a, that's a, traditional, uh, a traditional boat. Some of them are really comfortable. And exploring the Komodo Archipelago, and I can tell you there are some unique uh, islands, uh, diving, snorkeling. And it's an easy add-on to Bali. You can fly to, from Bali to Lombok. You take a Garuda flight. One and a half hours later, you're in La Bacho and you're in a completely different world. Usually, people come to Flores for two or three days, and, but you can extend that. And because we have an office in Flores, we can also do overlands into the island. And there is villages where you have the Linko rice fields and a lot more, but of course that is time time uh, constraint. But Flores is a, it's an amazing destination, and 
with that, I think I, uh, I, I finish. I can talk about more, but then uh, Mike will cut my head off. So uh, <laughs> let, let's go on to let's go on to some uh, some questions. If you guys have any questions, we'll be happy to to answer. Them. Perfect. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. And you know, as you can probably hear, Gonzalo is just so indicative of what Gary Travel is about. You know, every weekend you feel like the guy is exploring somewhere else in Bali or jumping to another island in Indonesia. And I mean, he's actually one of the key reasons why we have such unique, interesting, and innovative experiences on the island of Bali. And it's just what Kiri Travel is about. You know, we don't want people to just kind of gloss over the destination, kind of see what everyone else is seeing. What we want to do is make sure that they're leaving feeling truly connected. And Gonzalo, who came there from southern Thailand where he worked for Kiri, you know, he's truly fallen in love with it, and the great thing is his passion and his dedication and exploration has really, really separated all of our experiences from the rest of the pack. So for that, Gonzalo, we do thank you so much, and I know for sure a lot of our clients will thank you as well. Thank you, Mike. So, Mike, this is Lee, and we've got some great questions here. So if you're ready, I think we'll just uh, jump right into those. Absolutely. Um, okay. Um, we have a question here about favorite luxury accommodation choices on Bali. But there's also a question that I would dovetail onto this about the different levels of accommodations that are available. So, Gonzalo, sort of a, a two-prong question there. Um, what your favorite luxury accommodation choices are, and then what other levels of accommodations are available? Yes, in, in Bali, of all the Indonesian islands in the archipelago, Bali is perhaps the best, the best suited for, uh, for luxury accommodation. Uh, Bali has been a, a destination since, since the 1930s, so it has developed over time to, to have some of the best uh, luxury accommodations. Just to give you an idea, there are three, three Amans in Bali. You have Amanusa in the south, in the Bukit, you have Amandari in Ubud, and in Mangis uh, on the east side of Bali you have Amankila, of course, who doesn't love to stay in Amman? But what we really like is to work with luxury properties that are people don't know about it. And what I'm saying about this is, I'm going to give you one example. There is a place in Munduk, in the mountains in the north of Bali. The place, I can give you the name, is called the Sanak, uh, Sanak Retreat. And, you know, it's a property, I think they probably have about 12, 12 units amazingly built, wood, all noble materials, in the most incredible setting, uh, beautiful, attentive staff. And these kinds of places, your clients might not know about it, for two reasons. Uh, one of them, a lot of them are new, and also they are not, they are not a, a big uh, brand, like let's say Four Seasons, or let's say Ritz Carlton, all of whom are located in Bali. And although we, we work with, uh, with them, we always try to, to suggest to, to our clients to experience these luxury places that are sometimes owned by locals, and in many times they're actually owned by locals, and they're in incredible locations. So just to, to close this up, I would say, you know, Sanag Retreat, great place. In Pemuteran, you have the Matahari. And of course, if you want to go more traditional, you know, you have the Ritz Carlton, you have the Four Seasons in Chimbaran, and you have the Amman. So Bali, in terms of luxury accommodations, is, uh, is up there. Okay, and still speaking about accommodations, we have uh, another question here. It says, for Flores and Komodo, what are the advantages or disadvantages of staying at a hotel versus staying on board a liveaboard boat? Great, great question, great question. And I will tell you, uh, the best way to see Flores is to do a combination of both. Uh, you, def, you must stay on a, on a boat. Uh, I usually suggest at least two nights, but depends, some people stay one night, but you must do it in a boat because the best way to explore the Komodo archipelago is by boat. But also, uh, 
you need to stay in a, in a hotel and you have some great luxury accommodations in Lawan Bajo and you also have some uh, more budget mid-range in Lawan Bajo. So a great trip will be arriving in Komodo, uh, sorry, arriving in Flores, taking a boat one night, two nights and then spending one night in Lawan Bajo. And spending one night in Lawan Bajo gives you the chance to, uh, to see a little bit of the hinterland as well. Oh, perfect. Okay. Uh, I, one more accommodation question and then we will move on. We, we have some other questions. We have someone wondering if you book all-inclusive resort stays. Sorry, I didn't catch the last, uh, last question. Oh, do you book all-inclusive resort stays in Indonesia? Not many. Uh, if, you if you compare, let's say, Indonesia with Mexico and places like uh, uh, Cancun or Puerto Vallarta, uh, there are some, but it's, Indonesia is not, not, not very big on it. And there are some great resorts that can do it, but staying in an all-inclusive in Indonesia will kind of defeat the, the point because, you know, there is so much great food out there, there is so many things to see, and you know, you can stay in a great, uh, comfortable, luxury place, but uh, I think all inns are, are better for places if you only want to do the beach or something like that. But if you really want to, to experience the destination, uh, it's, it's not, it's not the, the best choice. But yes, there, 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 are some, there are some in Bali, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Well, speaking of best choices, I want to move on to beaches. We have a question here about um, the beaches in Bali, many of which are considered to be quite busy. Is there a best beach to send cl to clients to visit? Again, very, very good question. Thank you. And yes, there are some beaches that for me in Bali are a no-go. Uh, the, the one that you want to avoid at all costs is called Kuta. And why you want to avoid Kuta, I'll tell you very simply. Uh, Bali is close to Australia, so uh, for Australians it's easy to to take a flight to Bali, it's only a couple of hours, it's cheap. So many Australians treat Bali as a, you know, just weekend destination and they all, luckily, they all flock to, to Kuta. So Kuta is kind of like a party, a very busy beach, which we, we basically don't do anything there. Uh, the beaches that I love in Bali, I can tell you, I can tell you a couple, but one of my favorites is Changu. Changu is north of Seminyak. Uh, this is on West Bali, and Changu is one of these places that are still not fully developed, but you still have some great, great hotels there. But it has a surfer vibe to it, long beaches, it's not crowded, you still have rice fields in the area, beautiful area, really, very really beautiful area, and of course you have some of the best, most consistent waves in, 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 in Bali. That's a great one. Uh, I also like Sanur. Sanur is a much more laid-back uh, beach. It's also uh, it's in the, on the east of Bali, so it's on the other side of the, of the island. And Sanur is a great place for families because the waves are very small. So if you have kids, uh, it's a good place to, to take them because it's easy to, to swim there. And there are some great accommodations there. Uh, that, that, that make it an, an interesting place to, to visit. And, and in Sanur, remember I was telling you about the dinner with a royal? This is in Sanur. So just by doing that experience makes it worth to go to Sanur. Of course, just to, to, to give you a little bit more details, there are, there are more beaches. Uh, I love Pemuteran, <coughs> excuse me, in the north. Uh, Pemuteran is uh, a black sand beach where you can access the Menchangan Islands. It's the best snorkeling in the island. So there are many great hidden beaches, but you need, uh, you need somebody who, who knows. Because if you go to, let's say, Kutas, e even Seminyak is becoming very developed. Uh, so the, 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 those places exist, but you need to know where they are. Mm, okay. Well, that's very good to know. Thank you. The, the dinners with the royalty that you mentioned, where are those, what area are those uh, do those take place? Okay, that takes place in Sanur, that is in the in the south of Bali, but you can go to that dinner if you're staying in Sanur, 
if you're staying in Seminyak, if you're staying in Changu, or if you're staying in Nusa Dua. Because it is located in the south of the island, it's easy to connect to all those places. But the closest place is Sanur. If you're staying in Sanur, it's a five-minute drive. All right, thank you. Now, uh, I may mispronounce this. We're going to try our best. Uh, we have an agent listening who has uh, spent some time in Bali, and he wanted to know if you take uh, travelers to Tirtanganga. Tir Yes. Yeah, you, 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 pronounced it, uh, you pronounced it very well. Yes, we do, and uh, Tirta Ganga is a, a water palace in, in northeast Bali, and we don't not only take clients to Tirta Ganga, we know the people who, it, it's, it's, a royal, it's a royal palace, we know the people who, who, who live there, the, the royal family, and you can actually spend the night there, and it's beautiful. I've done it with my family, Beautiful place, you know. Uh, at night, you hear the the, the water rumbling. Uh, yeah, it's an amazing place. We we know it. Yes, we can do it. Ah, oh, perfect. Thank you. And then uh, another a question about another area as well, Lombok, which you talked about. Uh, there's a question about whether the people are friendly to visitors there. Good question. Okay, Bali sets the bar really high because the people in Bali they're naturally they are genuinely friendly. I uh, I always joke, you know, we we go with the family to a restaurant. I have two young kids, and you know, the kids might throw something on the floor. You will never see a Balinese being angry or shouting at you or being pissed off. They they are they they are the, the friendliest people that I that I've, I've met. In Lombok, the people are more normal. You know, they are more uh, they're, they're, they they don't have that that charm of the Balinese. Uh, I wouldn't say they are unfriendly, but they are less friendly than in Bali. And uh, it, it has to do with culture, uh, but it's not. Uh, I don't see it. It's not. It's not that people are, are unfriendly. It's just they are less friendly than in Bali. That, yeah, that would be a good way to to put it. Mm, okay. So, what would be the best months to visit Indonesia, specifically the areas you've discussed today: Bali, Java, Lombok, Flores? Okay. Uh, good question. You, we have a we have two seasons in Indonesia, uh, a dry season and, and a rainy season. But having said that, and having lived in uh, in other countries in Asia, the rainy season that we experience in in Indonesia is not as dramatic or as wet as the one you will get in say Thailand or Laos. Uh, the the months when it rains is usually January, February. March, but it's not like it rains every day, you know, it, it hasn't rained in a week now, and uh, the best months for me are, I love May, June, because it's before, the, the highest season is July and August, that's the busiest months, so prior to the high season and after the high season are great months, so let's say uh, April, May, March, April, May are very good months, September, October, November, and of course the high season is, is great weather, but it's busier. I hope that, uh, that answers the question. Yes, thank you. And, and following up on that, we had another question, which is, if a client were to do a combination trip with Bali, Lombok, Java, how many days do you suggest that they allow for each place? Okay, good question. I will say, uh, Java, you need a, a three to five days. Bali, I will say uh, about a week, and Lombok about three to five days, depending on the activities. So on a, on a, on two weeks, you can do you can do Java, Bali, and Lombok. All right, thank you. And, and uh, this will depend. This will depend on on how many activities we build into the program. But say a classic. Uh, Java Bali trip will include Jogjakarta, it will include Borobudur, it can include you know the horse experience I talk about. Uh, if people have more time, they can go of course to Bromo and Ichen volcanoes. And then in, in Bali, what I was what I saying before, it's it's a destination in itself. You know you have mountains, you have beaches, you have culture. So you, you could spend a long time in Bali, but uh, if you have somebody saying okay, I want more active or more culture, you can build it and, and tailor made it around it. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. 
So uh, I have one more question for you, and then I have some business questions for Michael. Uh, we have someone here asking about Ubud, where the artists are, and whether that's an area you can take visitors. Yes, absolutely. The the day in the Balinese, uh, the day in the life of a Balinese artist, all the artists that we visit are in and around Ubud. Okay, good. All right, Michael, we'll bring you back in. We have some questions for you. Uh, this one is a a question just about um, the packages, the tours that you put together. Are these all FIT tours or are they group departures? Uh, we actually do both quite a bit. So what we really want to do is get to know the company or the agent that we're working with and whatever it is that is their philosophy in terms of travel and whatever their clients are looking for, we're more than happy to do. So yes, we certainly do both group and FIT. Although I will say, in the States, we probably see more FIT. OK. All right, very good. And then do you have any ready-made packages? Yes, we have a lot of our Highlights Done Right programs in every single one of our countries. So basically, that's going to be taking the standard routes with a bit of a carry twist. So you know, even if you are in Bali, we're always going to be introducing you know really neat special things that make it slightly different but yes we do have highlights done right programs ready to go all right and I know you're based in the US we have a couple of Canadian agents listening in who are wondering if they could work with you on some programs yeah absolutely I mean I'm okay with working with anyone from the North American market. We just make it so it's really easy because, of course, with the time change, um, I'm able to just, I'm on Skype all day or Gchat or whatever it might be, so I'm always chatting with agents, and if they have any questions, I can be able to answer them very quickly so they don't have to wait for the 24-hour turnaround. But yeah, I would absolutely work with Canadian agents. Okay, perfect, perfect. And are there any visa requirements uh, for this? Uh, this might be a question for Gonzalo, but I'll, I'll run it past you. Visa requirements for this destination? For Indonesia? Yeah. You can get one on arrival as okay. an American. All right, that's good. Sorry, sorry. You get 30, 30 days on arrival automatically. 30 days on arrival automatically. Yes. That's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. All right, let's see. We are close to having answered all of the questions. Michael, it looks like the last question here is about what the best gateways would be into Bali from the U.S. Sure. A lot of people, if you're going from the West Coast, a lot of people will um, go through Singapore. And you can also go through, there's budget airlines that actually go through China um, as a gateway. Denpasar is well connected to everywhere, so it is very easy to get to Bali. Um, and then from the East Coast, a lot of people, you might stop in Bangkok or um, Gonzalo, maybe, or Malaysia, places like that. Yes, and another, another good route is to fly to Incheon in Korea. You can fly in uh, Incheon and then direct to Bali. So there, there, is, there is many, many, many possibilities. But I will say Incheon, Bangkok, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore are the best, the best ones. Mm. It's just one, one stop over, one stop over. Just one stop over. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Well, terrific. This has just been wonderful. We filled our full hour, which was great, and we were able to get all the questions answered, which is even better. And so, let me turn it back over to you now, Michael and Gonzalo, for anything you might like to share before we go. Okay, absolutely, and thank you so much again for helping us out with that. It's a real pleasure to let everyone know about what we're doing in Indonesia, how we can help um, create ideal trips for really the discerning clients that just want to really feel connected to a destination. And, you know, that's what we do in every single one of our destinations. And as you can hear from Gonzalo, it's, it's the people that work for Kiri that really make it happen. It's just simply our passion for travel. So... You know, you do see my contact info there, and of course, as I said, I work in the United States, so I'm very easy to work with in um, regards to the time changes, you know, whether it be through Gchat, 
Skype, email, phone calls, whatever you need, I'm absolutely here to help. So feel free to reach out to myself if you need anything, and it would be a pleasure to help you. Okay, that's perfect. Okay, thank, thank you, you very everybody much. To, for, for listening and joining in. Yes, and, and Gonzalo, thank you for getting up early and for being here with us on your, on your Friday wearing your batik. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we'll say good day and conclude our webinar. Goodbye now. Thank you so much.